I'm usually pretty good with the clever intros, but uh, today I'm kinda at a loss. Are y'all cool with me just kinda starting off the top? <laughs> Alright, so the Halo franchise is about 20 years old, and the one thing that seems to go under discussed is the franchise's long and turbulent history with producing quality multiplayer maps. It's actually a really unique and complex topic. Where the average player just sort of assumes good maps apparate out of thin air, I'd argue the process of creating a high quality, well functioning multiplayer map is actually one of the hardest parts of creating a game in general. And the struggles related to creating what we'd consider a quote unquote good multiplayer map has changed so much over the last 20 years. Mostly because like 20 years ago, the devs didn't even care about making what we would consider a good map now. Wow. I'm the home slice, ascend period. And today, I want to talk about one of the most interesting phenomena in Halo game design. I want to talk about how the Halo maps we'd consider to be good are actually some of the most boring maps in the franchise. I want to break down how our quest to create progressively better and better maps came at the price of one extremely critical trait of multiplayer, uniqueness. Like always, you want to be sure you stick around for my viewer question at the end, and be sure you use the link below to follow me on Twitter. Let's get this thing started. I think if we're going to talk about how the best Halo maps ended up being the most boring Halo maps, we gotta understand the key elements that influenced this situation. These elements include the evolution of the FPS genre, and the change in intent of the designers. Let's talk about that evolution of the genre first. Over the last two decades, first-person shooters have risen up as one of the largest and most renowned categories for online multiplayer and esports alike. I think something we've forgotten is that multiplayer in many FPS games 20 years ago was just seen as a quirky add-on or a casual way to play the game outside of the single-player experience. Halo 2 was a critical catalyst for the franchise, where Bungie effectively took a pioneering role as one of the first major online FPS multiplayer experiences on console. Over the following 10 years, games that were once confined to couch co-op or screen peaky sibling battles were quickly becoming the subject of multi-million dollar player bases in 24-7 servers across the world. Over a generation of gaming, a facet of the game's experience once perceived only to be used sparingly in sleepovers and middle school hangouts had become a facet of a game that could make or break entire sales records. It became its own micro-industry, fueled by million dollar tournaments, real sponsorship deals, and viewerships in the hundreds of thousands if not millions. And if you're wondering what this has to do with a map's design, here's why it matters. When the demand for multiplayer changed, the intent of the designers when creating multiplayer changed. In the year 2001, if you were a game designer curating a multiplayer experience for a FPS game, your intention was probably to ensure you gave just enough to allow for casual 4 player experiences on maps that were complex or interesting enough to make up for the fact that 4 players can only get into so much trouble while playing. This extends out even to the LAN party situations. To do this, all you had to do is have some varied environments with at least enough weapons to keep people interested. Throw in an easter egg or two for good measure, and hey, if something is broken or unbalanced in multiplayer, don't worry. Players are likely to adopt it as a quirk or just as part of the game. In 2021, that ain't gonna fly. Your multiplayer experience is going to be one of the most intricately scrutinized facets of your game. Players from across the globe are going to be critiquing every single aspect of what you designed, and one major hurdle that has to be overcome is ensuring that you are providing the highest quality spaces possible to play the game in. Over the last 20 years, the field of multiplayer map design entered a golden age of research and development. Developers everywhere had to set aside the simple mission of making a map fun and had to really dial in on what type of maps best fit the gameplay experience they were trying to develop. It was now a package deal. 
This process involved massive amounts of refinement of map design, but one almost unforeseen consequence of refinement is the rejection of diversity. The refinement of a map involved ensuring that said map would play in line with a set of expectations. The goal transformed from simply providing a space for combat to using a space to control combat. Let me cut out the jargon for a bit and just give a few examples. Halo CE, Chiron. Could you, in your wildest dreams, imagine any AAA title releasing a multiplayer map that not only is littered with teleporters, it literally depends on them to function. Halo CE's Chiron is, for lack of a better word, a literal maze connected by an almost nonsensical series of teleporters. Could you imagine if the first match of MLG or whatever in Halo Infinite was on Chiron? The phase boy would be raking in millions, tearing the map apart for its quote unquote bad design. And then quote unquote bad designers who created it. So no matter how much fun it may have been in 2001, in 2021, Chiron is a bad map through that lens. So what's a good map in 2021? Do you like donuts? Great, here's a map that amounts to a circle. Nothing super unique, no quirks, no gimmicks, a circle with ramps. We're of course talking about midship, or any perversion of it, which has successfully appeared in three Halo titles as a mainstay of competitive play. Why? It's simple. No, like literally, the map is simple. One of the key elements of refined gameplay is ease of access. The quicker a player can become comfortable playing your map, the easier it is to let them focus on the gameplay design that you're trying to implement. In fact, simplicity was a primary driver behind other things considered good in the competitive world. Callouts, map control, and in Halo, movement predictability as well. Simplicity is one of our major controllers. Maps like Lockout, Sword Base, and Plaza are what I'd call deceptively simple. Whereas on the surface, the changes in elevation and the cornered spaces might make you feel like you're playing a pretty complex map. But in reality, these maps are nothing more than dolled up catwalks and boxed in rectangular spaces. Verticality became one of the quickest and easiest ways to designers can make a map seem more intricate than it actually was. You know what sort of verticality is actually intricate? The verticality on the map boarding action. Could you imagine queuing into a map that's literally split in two down the middle, where at pretty much any given point in time you can see the entire enemy team running around across multiple floors? Not today. Now of course, I'm not saying the change happened overnight. In fact, even up until 2010, we had some maps like Spire, which is a prime example of what you get when you let the shackles of over-designing fall away and just say, hey, this is the map I want to make. But what I'm getting at is that maps with quirks, gimmicks, or tricks were steadily bred out of Halo. For example, the classic one-sided defense maps. By no means are these maps perfect, no 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 no, but this concept of asymmetrical attack and defend gameplay was left out to dry following Halo 3, and was dead by the time Reach was released. Because this style of gameplay, this intentional imbalancing of the scales, came to be viewed as bad. Do y'all remember when Zealot tried to integrate reduced gravity into gameplay and the end result was Bungie blocking off the zero gravity zone a couple months later? <laughs> okay, look, I know it was actually poorly implemented in Reach, but I also noticed that the concept was, again, left out to die after Reach. For what better reason? I think the game that really finally fully shifted Halo away from the map design gimmicks that it had played host to for so long was Halo 4, which features next to none of the map quirks from Halo's past, all while not really introducing any new quirks of its own. There's some scattered examples, but not nearly in the volume as there were in the past. And the timing makes sense, because in 2012, the FPS genre and player base was riding a major obsession with pro gaming, and truthfully, all the way through even 2016 I'd say, developers were scrambling to create games that were pro-oriented. Even Destiny 2? <laughs> Even Destiny 2 launched claiming to be a competitive friendly game. <laughs> so if we fast forward to Halo 5, I think we get the clearest picture, and the game that's best to let me make my major point. Every dev made map in Halo 5 is 
good. Like, I mean, objectively, none of these maps are broken, none of them are unbalanced, none of them are inherently bad to play. But Halo 5 only has good maps because it only has boring maps. There's no diversity in the experience. Each map in Halo 5 boils down to catwalks and boxed off rectangles, or donuts. It's like this because it's an extremely efficient and safe way to design your play spaces. It allows the players to be fully dictated by the gameplay you've designed, rather than having to be dictated by the map's quirks at the same time. And to be honest, everything done in Halo 5's map design was just a continuation of what worked in the past. Hell, some of the maps in Halo 5 are literally just redesigns of each other. You can find elements of previous Halo maps in pretty much every Halo 5 map. It's a curious phenomenon, because it's a product of the tone and culture we set as gamers. No matter how much fun it may have been to play on maps like Last Stand or Chiron, these mechanics that directly drove gameplay were not the ones that became the fixation of the community. Over the last 20 years, it was our devotion to making games into a fieldable esport that created the environment where devs had to pour their resources into making things, quote unquote, fair and accessible, like any other sport. Now wait. This isn't me saying one is better than the other. I don't do that type of thing when I can help it. I'm just trying to frame up a really complex topic in like maybe 10 minutes time. And truthfully, this is also something best meditated on. Because for many gamers, I'm sure the shift in our culture went sorta of under-evaluated. So let's end today's video with a question. Do you think the effects of our fixation on competitive play are permanent? What would it take for developers to start to focus again on the quirks and gimmicks that defined shooter maps 20 years ago? Or should they even go back to that? Like always, thanks for watching. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't, and be sure to leave a like on the video. Follow me on Twitter for Halo and bullshit memes, and until next time, I'll catch you guys later.